we are excited uh, to bring back our Friday forums. Um, you know, there was a little disruption over the past few years that made life a little bit difficult for many of us, okay, all of us, um, and now here we are. So we are super excited uh, for the conversation we're gonna have for the next hour. Um, I'm gonna do just a quick tell you who's at the table, and then I'm gonna give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, but before we do that, you know, really the purpose of the conversation of today is to talk about health and health care and wellness and how it affects your bottom line in business. Uh, we hear often from our members that the cost of health care is debilitating to business. And we also know that we need our employees to be um, healthy and well in order to come to work and do good work for us as employers. And so how do we really make, what does that really look like and how do we make that work? And so we've got some healthcare professionals on the panel that are gonna talk about um, you know, health and healthcare from their perspective. Um, we've got some um, organizations, uh, employers from the area that, that are gonna talk about the wellness programs that they've implemented and how it has benefited their organizations. And then we also have a wellness professional that's gonna talk about um, those, what those wellness programs could look like. So with that, um, right here next to me, we have Nikki Miller, who is the director at Kohler Water Spa. Yay! <laughs> right next to her, we've got Kristen Stearns, who is the CEO of Lakeshore Community Healthcare. Next to Kristen is Dr. Rye, president and CEO of Prevea Health. And then we've got Brenda Blazier, RN and BSN occupational health nurse with Millipore Sigma. And next to her is Samantha Fredlick, HR Business Partner Manager, Georgia Pacific of Sheboygan. So with that, I am gonna pass the mic. Do you guys wanna rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first? Nikki goes first, oh, Nikki goes first. I like it, I like it. So this is a very long course, so you do have to get very close. Thank you for having me, such an honor to be here. As Deidre said, I'm the director of the Kohler Water Spas, so I oversee our two spa facilities in Wisconsin, one being in Green Bay, associated with Lodge Kohler. We have our headquarters in Kohler, which is associated with the American Club, and then we have two day spas in Chicago, and we also have a off-site facility in St. Andrews, Scotland. Um, I've been with the company for 25 years. I am a licensed therapist as well, or massage aesthetics, um, so I've spent most of my life in the beginning um, providing services for our community and our guests. And today, um, you know, focusing on new development, new product development. Uh, we work very closely with the plumbing side of, of Kohler to develop new experiences through um, health through water, uh, fixtures, bathing experiences, um, all kinds of different projects. So I'm excited to be here today just to give an insight on um, our, you know, our our product, our what we produce for people is providing massages and facials and manis and pedis for people. So they're exhausted, they're tired. Um, if I look at our associates, we have about over 500 just in spas right now. Um, they're physically exhausted, but I think they've they've endured a new exhaustion of of mental exhaustion just from the energy that they're um, consuming from their guest. And so. We'll talk more later about what's the best wellness program for those that are absorbing that kind of um, physicality from from their from their patients, I guess. So, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Cedar said, I'm Kristen Stearns. I'm the CEO of Lakeshore Community Healthcare. For those of you that don't know who we are, we're a Nonprofit organization located here in Sheboygan. We're in Manitowoc and now uh, have a site in West Bend. Um, we are what's considered a federally qualified community health center, which is just a lot of jumbled words for uh, that. We're here as a safety net provider, really to provide access to care to the community. So, those that are under and uninsured, folks with really high deductible insurances, but they're um, but their income falls again at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. We're really, uh, you know, we're a space that can can give them services at a discounted rate. We provide primary medical, dental, behavioral health, pharmacy, 
chiropractic and substance use services at most of our sites and we do do school-based uh, school based services also dental and mental health and um, you know we I, what I what I would say is uh, I I think a lot of people um, through the pandemic and I'm sure Dr. Rye will concur, really waited to get some health, their health care needs met. And so uh, we're just, we're, what we're seeing is sicker um, individuals with more chronic diseases um, throughout our community. Um, and then to go uh, with what you say, that, that secondary trauma that our employees are getting from that, um, trying to really help individuals manage their care is, is really um, a struggle right now. I'm not sure, Dr. Ray, if you're going to talk a little bit about how um, it also engages a little bit more violence in our workplaces than ever before. I'll let you maybe talk a little bit more about that. So, Thank you. And yeah, I think we could probably, between all of us, talk for hours on uh, what we love. Um, my name is Dr. Risho Gray. I'm the President and CEO of Bay Health. Uh, I am trained in both internal medicine and pediatrics, but began my career up in Green Bay, um, mainly seeing the sickest of the sick, so those that are inside the hospital, inside the intensive care unit is where my majority of my practice was. Now I still practice medicine, uh, being one of the only practicing CEOs in the Midwest, uh, but most of my practice is now outpatient-based, but still seeing pretty sick uh, patients. Um, have a lot of passions around wellness, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it. Uh, are you looking at it from a CEO perspective? We can talk about that. From a physician perspective or a science perspective, uh, there are a lot of different ways we can take your questions and comments. Um, but most importantly, I look at it today from a patient perspective. Uh, a lot of you may have tuned into a Zoom or two uh, that I had to be part of during COVID, or you know, might have watched uh, a, a television station that might have had me on every so often. Nothing like not having to get up at four o'clock in the morning. Though. I like that. Uh, but what you may not know, unless you did see the TV special on that, is uh, I'm approaching the one year anniversary of uh, 71 minutes. That's my cardiopulmonary bypass time. That's how long they had to stop my heart for uh, to cut my chest open and repair it. Uh, and that uh, during the preoperative uh, process found out I was an uncontrolled diabetic for the uh, medical staff in the room. I had a hemoglobin A1C of 10.8 which wow. meant that I was a very sweet man. <laughs> uh, and so I can talk about it from a patient perspective. You talk, you talk about everything that I got ignored. Well, I worked a little abnormally hard during COVID uh, and ignored everything else and literally almost lost my life because of it. So I can give you a lot of different perspectives and hopefully we'll take the conversation in a few different directions today. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm Brenda Blazer. I'm a BSN registered nurse. I am the occupational health nurse at Millipore Sigma. Um, my history, um, what's funny, is my former boss is sitting over there when I tried to do underwriting at um, Acuity. <laughs> I actually was technical support, went to Acuity, did that, and then tried to underwriting and it wasn't for me. So I became a nurse later in life. I, I graduated at 50 and um, started out at St. Nick's in labor and delivery, was recruited by my preceptor to Prevea, and I worked as a triage nurse for family practice and internal medicine. I left for a little bit just to get my um, bachelor's degree and worked for Aurora for six months and then was recruited over to Millipore Sigma. Uh, my job kind of entails a little bit of everything. I do work comp, I do just seeing people for bumps, bruises, or anything personal or work-related. I organize flu and flu clinics and blood drives and biometrics and I really try to help guide people in health and introduce them to our health and wellness program which is health advocates and also just guide them to I send a lot of people to prevail <laughs> just because I know that there's doctors taking people you know I think my biggest challenges like 20 year olds who come on and they don't have a PCP. They use urgent care as a primary care provider. So trying to get them into those positions. And so my um, former boss, I keep in very close contact with Kristen Eichberg. And, um, and thank you for being our COVID provider, COVID test provider um, all this time during COVID as well. And we partnered with Purveya for that as well. So. I'm looking forward to a better year, <laughs> COVID getting less and less, and looking forward just to help my employees to 
get healthier and to continue on and make that a priority in their life. Thank you, I'm Samantha Friendly, and I'm the HR business partner, uh, manager at Georgia Pacific here in Sheboygan. And uh, I have spent my career in HR and in manufacturing, so a really nice spot for me. Uh, I've been there for a total of nine weeks, so I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> um, but I also really wanna say, and I, I really appreciate what Dr. Rice said, because I really take the philosophy and the mindset of, you know, in HR we're not just instituting policies and procedures and all these things that people have to align to, I also write those for myself. I receive them as myself, for myself, if you will, because I'm also an employee. And so I think it's really important to sit on both sides of the table, listen to the workforce, and make improvements uh, accordingly. So happy to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the introductions. And I think this would be a great place for us to really start with our organizations and you know when we talk about workforce development clearly we don't have enough human bodies um, in Sheboygan County well in lots of places but most importantly in Sheboygan County because that's where we focus our efforts and um, and so the folks that we do have here we need to keep them healthy we need them to come to work every day and we need them to be as productive as possible so maybe with our um, folks from uh, Georgia Pacific and Millipore Sigma you can talk about some of the trends you're seeing with staff with um, illness with injuries etc and kind of how that's you know affects um, how successful or unsuccessful a business can be So, all right. So, being part of um, safety, that's a big thing for us, and it's a big push this year for Melipore Sigma. Um, we had 24 OSHA recordables last year, and we're trying to get on top of that this year. Um, one of the things that I did ask about from the health advocate portion of that, um, what the benefits were for people to focus on health and safety, and they said that you know having healthy employees save this company money in a lot of different ways. There's an absence perspective. If people are in better health, you have more productive per employees on the floor more often. And um, from a medical claims perspective, the cost, it costs the company less to engage employees with the ability um, to course correct their potential problems that they may have and get that under control than it is to actually treat a lot of disease. So if you can get people engaged, um, we offer a program with Health Advocate that we will pay every employee for certain things that they do. They'll pay them $200 to have their yearly physical. Um, and that doesn't mean that they paid for the physical, but um, we have really, really good insurance. So it's 20 bucks for them to go get their physical and they pay them $200 to have that done. If they get their flu shot, they get $100 for that. They can engage um, in other things on the Health Advocate site. They can engage in webinars. They can engage in challenges. They can do all of that. They'll equal up to $500, and they pay that out quarterly. So right now, we have about 59% of our employees engaged in that program. They can hook up their uh, eye, eye watches. They can hook up garments, they can hook up whatever, they can track their steps, they get money for that. Um, so that program has been really good and very attainable for all of our employees to participate in. And um, every year we just look for opportunities to help and we keep adding things to those programs all of the time. And um, also with insurance, uh, we offer up to $150 re reimbursement if you sign up for a weight loss program. If you sign up for a gym, they'll give you $150 back. So we really try to give a lot of incentives to stay healthy, and that will puts our bottom line with people on the floor more healthy working and not so much out being ill or not so much out being hurt on the job, like physically, especially if they keep their bodies in good shape. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate what you said, yeah. shared there, Brenda. Um, we take a very similar approach. I would change it a little for us in that, and I would say uh, we take less out of the paycheck instead of like giving back. Uh, we incentivize and we say, hey, if you and your spouse, you know, we'll do a wellness um, exam, you learn your baseline, and then you build from there with a lot of our programs. You know, 
your cost isn't as high as someone else who doesn't go that route, if you will. Um, and so our employees like to have less come out of their paycheck, if you will, but we also like to receive incentives, of course, so that's great. Um, and I can appreciate what Deidre was asking, um, because I think for us, we take the approach of um, wanting our employee to be healthy inside of work and outside of work. And um, so we do a lot of different like fun challenges. You mentioned like walking programs, that's something we do. There's a really neat stat out there um, for Georgia Pacific, and I think the starting point is our corporate location, which is in Atlanta, but I did a walking challenge, and um, the employees that participated walked billions of miles in, in a year's time, and that equated to 26 times to the moon and back. And so it's just kind of a fun, fun stat, making it you know, challenging to folks and saying, okay, now next year we wanna, maybe we wanna walk to all of the planets and back 26 times, and just really um, having something fun, thinking about it, not all the terms, not, not every employee understands all of the benefits available to them quite often, they find that they find themselves in a spot where they actually they need it, but didn't know they needed it. And then all of a sudden they're learning about our array of benefits. And we do a ton of programs, ton of incentives, um, you name it. Uh, as far as um, uh, safety and, and health in the workplace, we have like a Brenda on site. Um, it happens to be with Bell and Health. Um, and our rep works between our um, uh, Green Bay and Sheboygan location. Um, but she comes on uh, site twice a month. And uh, what we really appreciate and what she really gives the employees is she follows up and she's meticulous about that. And you know, she doesn't let the employee get away with maybe not following their steps uh, mm -hmm. and their you know, care plan and their care practice because we care about our employees enough to make them whole and come back to them and hold them accountable in the right way, right? And so um, we just have a really nice program, consistent. And then what we find is that employees say, hey, when is she coming back again? And so they start looking forward to the benefit and the tools available to them. Putting that employee first, making resources available, and then educating them on those resources when they realize they need them, or they just want to ask a question, or they just don't understand it. We're there, we're that resource, um, and uh, maybe they'll find out in the future they want to know more, they want to learn more, they want to, uh, or they have a need, or something happens with their spouse, you name it, or a child. Uh, so we're there, make that employee whole, and um, be the resource. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Rye, I'll pass this over to you in a moment, but maybe you can share, you know, especially from um, the medical doctor perspective, kind of the trends you're seeing and you guys partner, you guys being Prevea, uh, partner with many employers throughout the state of Wisconsin. And so maybe you can speak to some of the experiences with that and um, some trends that you guys are seeing and ways that you are looking to counteract some of the negativity or the negative effect. Sure, and you know, it's uh, important to recognize also I'm an employer, I have 2,400 employees, so uh, it's, uh, we're not uh, immune uh, from our own uh, health issues. You know, I think we talk a lot in COVID about follow the science, right? That's a common mantra I probably said to the, I was blue in the face. So if you actually follow the science on wellness, which is a $50 billion industry right now in the United States, last quote I saw in an article, it's companies spending $50 million on wellness programs. Uh, and are we actually seeing the reward of that? So there was a randomized control trial, so those of you who know statistics or science would understand that that's one of the best powerful studies we could do. You take a large group of people and you randomize them, and, you, and they did this in 2019. We didn't really pay attention to the article because something else came up. Uh, <laughs> and, and they took a, thousands of employees in a, of a university and you got wellness programs and you didn't. And actually there's a really good wellness program, you name it, HRA, it's exercise programming, all the stuff that you know we sell, to be honest with you, in healthcare. And you know what they found? None of it actually works when it comes to one specific bottom line issue that every employer is always focusing on, which is the cost of what they're spending in healthcare. So it's not to say that wellness programs don't work, so I think it's important when you go into launching a wellness program is why are you doing it? Is it around employee engagement? Deidre uh, pointed out that you know we're in a labor war right now. Um, so it is, a, is it around offering a program that engages your employees and makes them want to stay? Is it a benefit to them? But is it actually gonna lower your healthcare costs? Actually only one thing in uh, the articles was actually proven to lower their healthcare costs. Does anybody know what that is? I want one guess. Josh, you're not allowed. You work for me. 
the employees themselves? The want, yep. the want to do it, the employees themselves? Uh, the, only, the only single activity that's been shown to lower health care costs is a primary care visit once a year. Oh. So believe it or not, so I mentioned my little issue. <laughs> so as a really well-trained internist, I kind of figured I'd know when something was wrong with my body, so I might have skipped a visit or two, or ten, so ten years without a visit. And, but, in that time period, I participated in almost every wellness activity that Hervea had. I raced in two centuries, if you know what that is. It's a bike race where you race 100 miles. One, actually, my first century was down here in Sheboygan. Uh, I um, am one of the OGs of Peloton, the I mean, I actually, you know, was one of the original owners. I've gone in the studio. I remember them celebrating my 100th ride and all those, all that. Did all of that during this time period, but I never went to the doctor. And what did we find out from skipping 10 visits? Uncontrolled diabetic that needs to have his chest split open. And think about how much that cost per day. I know, I had to write the dang check. <laughs> so, so you think about the wellness activities that we're all talking about here, and, and you have to go into them and ask the why behind it. So from a physician's perspective and a healthcare perspective, we want to follow the science. Well, there's really strong science around engagement of your employees in wellness activities. So make sure that you have programming that's engaging them and that they want, not that you think they need. And then more importantly, if you're trying to lower your costs, you are likely not going to make anybody significantly healthier when it comes to their overall spend with that programming. You're going to need to find the activity that does. So all three of us actually mentioned that we have incentives in place, whether it's a cash incentive or a lowering of your health premium like at Prevea, if you have that visit. And that will actually lower your cost. But more importantly, you have to look as an employer, where are you spending your money? Is it on meds? Is it on specialty meds that could be reduced? Is it on catastrophic care? What could be prevented? Are you actually getting care from a site of service at the right rate? Are you getting an MRI that's based inside a hospital where you're likely gonna pay tenfold because the hospital actually has to stay open 24 hours a day, or are you having it in an outpatient setting where the MRI is anywhere from $500 to $900? So when you're actually talking about cost reduction, it's not always about making your employees healthier. You only have a certain amount of control over that. If you have a full amount of control about where you spend your money, and the small amount of control you have, follow the science and make sure they're engaging. But don't forget that the wellness activities actually are engagement activities. There are ways to engage your employees and retain your employees. So I'm not saying, you know, we follow the science every day and as a very large employer, we actually have pretty nice wellness benefits. But I don't look at them as a way of saying I'm going to spend less on healthcare. I look at them in, as a ha happier workforce, a more engaged workforce. And why would they want to leave if they got benefits like that? So at Purveya, you get the Peloton app. I don't know why all of a sudden became a spokesperson for that. <laughs> uh, you get the app for free if you use it. We pay for that because we're spread across the states. You can imagine trying to pick a gym and you're gonna make somebody unhappy and somebody happy with that. So we don't really have a gym benefit. We have a wellness benefit that includes that amongst other things. But you pay a lot less for your health insurance at Prevea. If you do one thing a year, go to your doctor, which I am now incented to do. <laughs> way too much. On way too many meds for the rest of my life. And I will live with the scars for the rest of my life as well. There was a question. Yeah, real quick. On the randomized testing, did that include mental wellness? So the randomized control trial was really focused on wellness programs. They did have, um, and I'll, I can actually, it's a 2019 trial uh, done at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana. So you can uh, Google the original article, which is in uh, the Wall Street Journal under wellness programs, but the actual scientific article comes out. You can find it on PubMed. Um, out of the University of Illinois, it's a publicly available article. They had a um, psychological component to their wellness programming, but I wouldn't say it was a mental health program as you would traditionally look at it. And as my colleague and Nikki pointed out, when it comes to the programming that we need, and as both of us as healthcare providers, or three of us as healthcare providers would point out, that the mental health component in the post-COVID world, even in the pre-COVID world, uh, is definitely outstripped our ability to provide it. That's how big of a need it is right now. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I was going to follow up.
prompt a question, but if you've got something you'd like to share, go for it. <laughs> I was like, I can, but I'm happy to. I was just because of. I was just gonna actually pass it over to you, Kristen, and you support um, a lot of folks throughout our area as well. Uh, and so maybe you can share really some of the trends and, and you know, when we think about, you know, you guys see a lot of folks, but um, maybe what are some ways that our employers, because really this is, you know, about how do we, benefit, how do we get our, our employers the benefit of making sure or ensuring that their workforce is healthy and active in the wellness and healthcare game. Um, but what are you seeing? What would you like to see employers doing differently? And what do you think could really save them money in the end if they did? Obviously, Dr. Rice shared, uh, just go to the doctor. And I will just put this plug in. As a wife, I go to the doctor every year. My husband, probably 10 years and he didn't go to the doctor. Thankfully, nothing was wrong, but I don't know if it's a man versus woman thing or not, but um, I feel like women are maybe more inclined to go. In the Midwest. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so thank you, Deidre. I think, um, I mean, I agree with Dr. Ryan, not even knowing that study, though I probably should. I feel terrible I did not know it. Clearly I was too busy trying to deal with COVID, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I, it, again, it is, and what we've seen is those, those lack of primary care visits overall are costing you money in the end, right? Because uh, more and more people, uh, we're, we're seeing sicker and sicker people uh, with, with multiple chronic diseases now that uh, before COVID, and I, I'm gonna put COVID as a piece of this, right? All of us were told not to go to the doctor because we were trying to take care of really sick individuals that needed all of our expertise and, and our employees. And so we asked you to please not come in and to put off things. And, um, and it's created a, a, a crisis at this point of, of, into, of, of where we're at as a country around our overall health, including our mental health for sure. Um, I think the biggest thing, my thing, my take, one takeaway is if you, overall is, um, we see a lot of individuals who are employed. Uh, it's a misnomer that we are somehow a free clinic and everybody we see does not have a job. And, but we see a lot of your employees, um, you all don't understand what their potential uh, federal poverty level is. And what we really want to say is, we need to eliminate that barrier to access to care, um, whether that's dental health. And so we pull our, I always say, we somehow pull our teeth out of our overall health and we pull our brain out of our overall health and we just look at our everything else. But all of that plays a role in, in the productivity of your employees. I am telling you, a toothache is the most painful thing in the world and will make an employee the least productive. They can't think, they can't function. Uh, it is it is detrimental to their overall health. I often will get phone calls from, uh, and especially small business owners and nonprofit leaders. I have an employee with a with an abscess tooth, and um, and think about where your mouth is and where your brain and your heart is. Um, that infection uh, can create so much more damage. And so again, we just need to be proactive and. Um, in engaging with our employees, understanding their needs as a family, as individuals, and getting them to the right space and place for care. So if they're at or below 200% of the federal poverty level, and they have high deductible insurance plans, like we have, I don't, like, I, I mean, you know, there's no, I, I, I'm super jealous. I might come go work for you all, because <laughs> what we do incentive programs, again, small businesses and nonprofits, and I know there's a lot of you in this room, we don't have that luxury to do um, all of those cool engagement things like you all do. I mean, we try to give discounts where you can. We, engage, we, we have discounts for gyms and things like that. But, you know, the, when we're really looking at, at somebody to get them that access, we can still give discounted care. Being on an insurance plan doesn't, um, does not uh, dissuade that eligibility. And so a patient walking in our doors, say that they're at 150% of the federal poverty level. Um, 
which I can't get off my head. So 200% of the federal poverty level right now is about $25,000 for an individual, just so we're clear on that, right? Family of four, we're talking about 50 some thousand dollars. The median income here in Sheboygan County is about 50 some thousand dollars. So it just, you know, we, we need to think about that. But if we, we can get people access to that care and we can give them a discount, so they're only paying off of that copay $45 to us, we can get them healthy. And that, that is super important. And I think we, again, primary care visits are the start of that. Um, encouraging, talking to your employees about, uh, you know, colon screenings, breast cancer screenings. I know these are things people don't want to talk about, but that's what saves lives, that preventative, regular screening care. Um, on the mental health side, um, listen, it is a struggle. The struggle is real. We don't have enough therapists. You don't have enough therapists. I think we all probably have six to months to a year wait in most cases in this community. Um, the struggle is real. It, it is, and we know it, and we're trying. Just so you know, we know we're trying, but they, uh, there are not enough graduates graduating uh, programs to provide therapy, and so it's a we're we're you know we're in the we're in a new phase. When I graduated as a therapist, nobody wanted me. <laughs> there were too many. <laughs> so I decided not to keep my degree and go on and now I've you know you know so again these uh, this ebbs and flows and so um, know that things like um, apps like the call map things like that are great uh, add-ons or opportunities for your employees uh, talking about creating psychological safety in the workplace how do we rise raise conflict and deal with it because again where do things get stressful when we can't communicate with each other so those are, when I think about where in the, the where in the therapeutic world we can help it's it's giving that base to our employees talking about uh, and understanding um, understanding area areas and identifying areas in need with our employees so things other options qpr question first rate response respond uh julie's here today mental health america will come out and do that for you um mental health first aid an opportunity for some of your employees to get these um you know to be peer supports within your organization are ways to help reduce some of that stuff. So, all right, I talked too much. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so we've talked a, a, quite a bit about some mental health stuff, and so I'm going to pass this to Nikki, um, where she can share with us maybe some ways you can engage your employees or your employees can engage in um, spaces that might help alleviate some of that mental health concern. Thank you. So, so many great topics down the line. I'm like, I wish I had a note paper to keep notes on everything I wanted to say because I talk too much too. So anyways, I think, you know, to kind of back up, and I'm going to reference you as I remember, um, the wellness industry as it stands today globally, so not domestically, but globally, is, is a $3 trillion industry um, that they're seeing is even exceeding manufacturing or any other industry globally. So just think about that. Like, and it's not gonna stop there. They're, they're projecting right now in the next year it's gonna hit $5 trillion globally. So we partner with a global wellness organization and um, so it gives us a, you know, a bigger picture of what's really going on in the world. Um, you know, we know that mental health and suicide is up 300%. That 300% was something I learned two years ago. It's probably doubled today, right? Um, not my area of expertise, but I know it exists. Everybody in this room has someone that they know, whether it's in their workplace, whether it's personally, professionally, that is struggling with some sort of burnout, depression, struggling with belonging, fitting in with community, whatever that might be. In the top 12 global trends of of globally, one of the top 12 trends is um, the struggle of loneliness. As a society, people are, I'll say, fading or um, dealing with loneliness. And so to Dr. Rye's point, we, we have a program through, a wellness program through Purveya. It's great. You have an app. You're told what to do. You can click on the links. Um, but we can't control who's doing that and at what capacity are they doing that. And yes, the tools are available, but what are they actually, how are they actually engaging in some of these tools? Are they just checking the box 
are they really truly using the tools to their to their benefit? So some of the things that we do, and this might help your organization as well, and I would challenge all of you as well. We know the tricks. We know people put their watches on their feet and walk around and get extra steps, right? They're gonna work the system to get save a dollar. Um, but we create work groups. So we will actually, within our organization, we will grab associates that are interested and we start to create little, commu not little communities, we, we create groups or communities because there's, right, that sense of belonging and it encourages each other, it engages each other to go around the block and do a walk. Our break room, we've removed, we've removed all the vending machines, all the food, and we are now providing baked, um, you know, I know people love chips, right? But they're baked chips, or they're granola bars. We've got purified waters. Um, we have apps on the TV screens that are playing these meditational kind of experiences. So while they're sitting there, it's going on in the background. And even though your brain isn't, you might not, you might not think you're paying attention to it, but it is playing and your, your brain is catching, it's catching some of those messages. Every Monday we have morning meditation and guess what, you don't have a choice, you're gonna participate. And we have people that come in and they teach you how to breathe. 80% of the population doesn't know how to breathe today. Breathing is part of what oxygenates our entire body. And to Dr. Rye's point, follow the science, right? We know what oxygen does to the body. So they don't even know they're taking care of themselves and they can't figure out when they leave to go out to take care of you know six six guests, how they feel better. Wednesdays is Wellness Wednesdays. Um, we provide free yoga class for all the associates to come up and participate in yoga. For six months, guess how many people showed up? Zero, zero. I sat in the room by myself. We had the best professionals of yoga instructors. We started to take it as a group. Hey, started a chat. Hey, we're going to yoga on Wednesday morning at seven. Are you guys all coming? By that next week, we had 15 people participating, right? So how are you leading your team? What are you doing to engage and to bring your team with you? They don't have the self-motivation right now because they're burnt out to self-motivate themselves. They need someone to help in them and hold them accountable, and an app is really difficult to respond to. So when you're in front of them and you're saying, we're going this, and they start to see that there's this movement and you're creating a culture in your business, all of a sudden people start to journal and they start to talk and they start to share and they start to eat healthier and they start, hey, we have a break together at two, you wanna go take a quick walk around the block. It starts to become part of their, their self-wellness. Um, I'm probably asked 10 times a day, can you, can you create a home care self-wellness? Like, how do I go home and take care of myself? How do I, um, you know, how, how do I do better at home? And People are longing for this information, and it's simple. And I think you know there's a balance between Eastern and Western medicine, right? Like you have to have both because there's a science behind things, but then there's the feely part of things where um, it's just educating and giving people the tools and the opportunity to one learn about it. It's a lot of it's education, um, but how are we as leaders and leaders of our organization um, leading our teams and leading by example, right? Like you didn't go to the doctor for 10 years, but you're educating your people to come see them, right? So leading by example, our staff right now, to your point, are probably the least healthiest people in the industry. And all they do all day long is care for others. That's, that's not okay, right? So we have to also lead by example and give them permission and help them understand what they can do to take better care of themselves. Um, we do have internal programs where every associate gets four free services the uh, four services a year. Last year, I looked at the numbers. Twenty five percent of our staff used them. When they're done, they're gone. They're getting free massages, free. They don't have to pay a single penny. They don't. They don't use them. Do you need protein? They don't. Yeah. Can we donate them? Um, do we under, I mean, who does that, right? And so these 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 things are available to them, and they they don't. They don't do them. They're tired, they're exhausted, they're burnt out, they don't even have energy to stay and enjoy themselves. And there's another big part of it which I could talk for hours for. And as humans, we have a heavy load of guilt. We feel guilty to stay and take care of ourselves. We feel guilty to make our, our employees and our partners and our colleagues work on us after work. We came in and did services for your whole team and we had her nurses crying the moment we touched them. Some of them we were touching with like little Theragun machines and the moment that someone touched them, they had tears in their eyes. 
they would never have gone and done that for themselves, right? We gave them little essential oils, something so simple, and they were like in tears, right? So we just have to think outside the box of what are the little things, and sometimes it's just someone thought about me, right? And that, to your point, where the engagement, where our goal is they don't want to leave us. It's not because we saved you $100 because you joined the 10-step challenge. Actually, no one's allowed to join the 10-step challenge by themselves. We always have, we call it wellness warrior groups, uh, where we have people in groups. And then we make it fun and have internal incentives. But it costs us nearly nothing, right? So it's figuring out those things. So thank you. Well, I think I speak for most people in this audience when I say I would strongly encourage Kohler to donate the 75% of services that are not being used on an annual basis. And we can kind of do a thing at the chamber if you'd like. We'd be happy to support that. We'll partner and we'll just start doling them out, right? Okay. Um, I know we're getting short on time. I would like to pass it over to Dr. Rye again. And we, you know, we talk with a lot of small businesses. We represent probably close to 97% of our chamber businesses are small businesses. And in many cases they say, how can I afford to help my people stay healthy? So maybe you could talk about some ways that you're aware of that might help them. You know, I think probably the biggest thing that I did wrong, I think I always learned from my mistakes is, you know, as a physician and in the healthcare industry, you get a little egocentric. In other words, you, you know the answer, right? Like I know when I'm gonna be sick and how stupid was I? So I think stepping out of your own box and thinking you know what your employees want rather than asking them uh, what they want, I think was the single biggest difference that I, that I made. When I looked at lack of engagement in certain areas, it's because we weren't really talking to people uh, and understanding what their needs are. Maybe it's not mental health. Maybe it is you know, just the ability to socialize. You know, wellness doesn't have to be expensive. It, granted, it's, we just use numbers like billions and trillions of dollars, but the actual performing of taking care of oneself and the needs for that don't have to be expensive. And it doesn't matter how small or big you are, there's opportunities to engage your employees. So maybe they do want to do group activities. Maybe not just to get better, but just to be with some other people. So maybe it's partnering with the chamber and doing a wellness activity in their you know, beautiful new conference room. How's that for a plug? All right. <laughs> I, mean, I think, can practice my yoga. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me doing that. Trust me. Uh, I, I need to. But I, you know, I think I get asked a lot from smaller employers, how can I do something? Our healthcare is so expensive. And what I'm really trying to do today is, is make sure you're drawing that difference between what you're spending on healthcare. That is a whole other conversation that we can spend hours on versus what are you doing to take care of your employees? And that's the wellness conversation. Where CEOs fail is when they are looking at this hand and talking about the wellness conversation. And then their CFO is that other angel on their shoulder mm -hmm. going, so what's the ROI? Mm -hmm. Smack that angel or that devil off that <laughs> shoulder. Don't go smacking your CFO. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> Mine will punch me. Josh knows. She will punch me. <laughs> but she did ask him with ROI. I'm like, Lori, it's not about the spend. If I were to tie our in wellness investments to my healthcare spend, I would call myself a failure right now because our healthcare spend this year is $3.2 million over budget because of 22 catastrophic cases. And that wellness program would have done nothing to affect those 22 cases. You know what would have affected those 22 cases? Go on to the doctor. Guys, I'm good at this now. You're getting there. I like it. So I think it's really important that we start to draw some of those divisions because every one of you works for a company where you're an independent business and you're thinking about how to afford tomorrow, right? But if you start tying your wellness programs into your ability to afford tomorrow, you will fail your employees. Wellness is about engagement and retainment and the improvement of the people that you love because I love all 2,400 of our employees and that's the way I look at it. The health insurance... That's a whole other conversation that we need to have, like deeper dives, site of service transformation, why are you getting an MRI here versus not here? Why are we spending X amount at a quaternary center that, that care could have been provided locally? Like why does care, when you look at your expense sheet, go look at to see how much leaves Sheboygan County? I guarantee you almost 50% of what left Sheboygan County could have stayed here. 
if you had had your plan design better, and you would have saved millions. But it would totally distract you from the wellness conversation that we're trying to have. So I think it's really important to start dividing that out. The, fit, the, the trillion dollars, the billion dollar industry on wellness is not about reducing your healthcare spend. The minute you try to make it that, you won't spend the money where you need to. And more importantly, you won't spend the time where you need to. I was just thinking of a practical thing that you can do, and I have the advantage that I've worked in both healthcare systems and I stayed close to everybody in that healthcare system. But if you have an occupational health nurse at your company, or if you have an HR person, I'd highly encourage you to reach out to the manager of the clinics in your area and find out so that the people can go visit a doctor who's taking new patients. Do they have new doctors? There's a lot of turnover a lot in this area. Find out who's here now. Find out who is taking new patients. And so when people come to you, you can give them a name because there's nothing worse than handing out Go on this website, check out, see who's in your network, and try to pick a name just out of random. If you can get some insight on them, if you can see that they maybe are really good in a certain area, I have the advantage that I know the doctors that I worked for those doctors and I know who's great and who would really match with somebody, but that's what I keep trying to push is sign up, get a doctor, see, your, see somebody every year. And then that way, it's, a, it's just a more personal way to um, be able to give a name instead of go to this list on a website. You know, and for our larger employers, a lot of them pay us or a very small fee to hire an in-house care navigator. Mm -hmm. We're complicated. We're confusing. We suck as an industry when it comes to navigating us. It's really difficult. You think about my healthcare journey, I should probably know who to call, when to call, and have it done. And I even ran into stumbling blocks and, and frustrations and had to call in many a favor. Uh, so care navigation is, if you are looking, now once again, if you're looking to get that cost reduction, not that wellness arm, but one of the biggest investments you can make in cost reduction is having somebody help your people navigate care. From finding a PCP to my knee hurts, where can I get therapy before I go out and get an MRI that I don't need, to I found a lump, it's Saturday morning, what do I do? You know, who's, what's the easy button? Because I'm scared. So I think it's really important to, to think about where you put your investments in. It's more than cost savings, once again, it's around that engagement and taking care of people you love who, who obviously help you make your living if you're running a business, and it's your people. Thank you, and I'm going to um, bring this back to Samantha for a moment before we finish up, and, and if there's questions, then we'll um, think about those, and we'll get to those in a moment, but from an HR perspective, you know when people call in, you know how many people you need to hire, you know what your turnover looks like, um, so maybe tell us if you could pick to the top three things um, that an employer can do to, you know, attract, retain, and keep their folks healthy, what would that look like? What advice would you give? That's a really great question, and I think a lot of us, if we had the magic answer, we'd be fully staffed, and you know, we'd have zero turnover, but um, that's not to say that we don't have a lot of wins and a lot of successes, and um, so it's a really good question. Um, I'm always going to say, you got to listen to your, the workforce, you got to listen to the people, right, and I really truly believe I'm not just on one side of the table, I'm on both. Um, so, you know, what, what we're hearing, what we're, what we're listening to is, um, things are very confusing. Uh, you know, at GP, we do a really good job. We literally have one number you can call, and you will get an answer to all the complexities and benefits and wellness, and all the terms you never knew you needed to know. You know, we try to simplify and break it down. Um, and um, so I'll say that, right? Um, let's see, three things uh, to your question. It's a great question. Listening, of course, uh, providing those resources, and then following up. I think that's really important. So uh, someone will come to me with a need, and I listened. I got a solution, but I absolutely followed up. And if I didn't have a solution, I go right back and say, I'm still working on it. And remind me, we're talking about this, this, and this, correct? Because what I also find out is then that's compounded to more concerns they didn't realize until after they left and they thought about it more. And so it's really full circle um, back. So I'll say that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I know we are at time, but are there any questions from you guys that haven't been answered yet? All right. Well, the good news is, is you guys must have told them everything they need to. <laughs> going once, going twice. Okay. So um, I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers today. This is a conversation, you know, again, especially from the Chamber's perspective, we represent about 730 members or businesses, if you will, um, that represent 50,000 or so employees throughout Sheboygan County and beyond. And we hear the same things over and over. We can't find enough folks. We can't retain our folks. And of course, now with the healthcare crisis and, you know, COVID and all these weird things that have happened in the past um, few years, it's how do we keep our people happy, healthy, and, and productive. And so having these conversations is um, truly uh, beneficial to everybody who was able to participate. This was recorded on WSCS, so if you know somebody in your circle that wasn't here and you'd like to share it, um, that will be made available on their website shortly. And um, lastly, I do want to say thank you to um, Dr. Rye and Purveya Health. They have been the uh, financial supporter of our Friday forums for several years. And without that financial support, we would not be able to um, offer programming like this. So truly thank you to you and Purveya Health and your continued support and partnership with the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. And if you have additional questions beyond, I can get you in contact with them. But we also have several folks, I think, in the room, too, that offer lots of benefits and programs and services that you might find beneficial for your teams um, when you go back to work. So thank you. <laughs>